Ready, Freddy, for a crazy little thing called the Stick to Wrestling Podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is John McAdam, and this is Stick to Wrestling. It is a wicked good podcast. I, I think so, and I hope if you've listened before, you think so as well. There are some good podcasts out there, but how many of them are wicked good? Let's ask this guy. Well, there you have it. That's an authority. The only wicked good podcast out there. Give us 60 minutes, and perhaps indeed... We will give you a raw bone podcast. And with that, I want to bring on my convivial co-host, Mr. Sean Goodwin. We are going to the social media part of our show. Because when you think me, you think social media, who doesn't even have a Twitter account. Well, I, I think I do, but I don't know what the, anything about it is. If you see my Twitter account, ignore it, because I never check it. Anyway, so, but our Facebook page, more importantly, I am there, and so is John, and so is a bunch of other great guys. And if you haven't, weren't there this week, this is what you missed. Did Bob Backlund keep his crown 40 years ago? A hint, he did. What the hell is Bischoff wearing? Uh, you, did you see that, John? Uh, Bischoff. Uh, <laughs> it was wonderful. There was an ad from like 81 where one of the guys was wearing one of those, like uh, the, the things that college uh, football guys used to wear, those uh, cutoff shirts. Mm-hmm. And right next to them is Uncle Eric with the six ninety nine shorts on sale. Uh, who knew? I didn't know you did some modeling early on, but that's up there, too. And uh, what did the crusher really drink when out in the town with the boys? It was not beer. So you get to find all that out just from our Facebook page. Us and we have over 800 fellow members now. There you go. Um, We're going to talk about the Facebook page a little bit. I didn't even catch who did this. This literally just happened. There was an incident on last week's, this week's Monday Night Raw, where Jerry Lawler referred to an Asian wrestler's uh, move as a Raymond Noodle suplex. And someone in the Facebook group, and I didn't even catch his name, I just deleted the comment. It was like, uh, oh, libtard, weak, uh, you know, every cliche out there. And it's like, look, every Anglo dude out there, listen to me for a second, you've never had to put up with that. You've never had to put up with that. I went to a Red Sox game, I think in 2003, when someone was mocking Ichiro Suzuki for being Asian. And thankfully, a couple of people told him to shut up. Like a guy, a couple of rows across, and say, shut up, asshole. And like the guy turns around like he's going to do something. And the woman in front of him shames him and says, asshole, sit down and shut up. And he did. And he, like a, you, Ichiro's sitting there just being a great, exciting player. And this guy decides to start dumping racism on him. And it, it, it sucks. And Lawler is tied for my second favorite wrestler of all time. It's like a five-way tie. I think he's that great. But he had to know what he was doing when he said that. He had to know he was gambling a little bit. And it looks like it's the end of him in WWE for knowingly doing something stupid. He knew he was taking that risk. A quick aside on uh, the, the discussion from the Facebook page. I hadn't even seen this yet. This is one of, I would say, out of 10 discussions we have on the Facebook page, maybe one is about modern wrestling. So you don't, really, <laughs> don't even really see this. Most of our discussions is about 1979. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, oh, let me throw a quick aside in this. It is April 15th. We are still all in our virus bunkers. And last fall, I came up with an idea. I was going to buy a pair of clippers and maybe start cutting my own hair, right? Pay 25 once instead of paying 25 every three weeks. So I did an absolutely awful job on my hair. I've got like several little bald patches, but whatever. I did it last uh, Thursday night. And you have to put they... the vacuum on medium, John. <laughs> it doesn't even have a vacuum. Maybe that's the, the problem. No, it wasn't a Floby. It was, uh, it was... You sprung for a Floby. <laughs> I should have gotten a Floby, but too late. But anyway, today I go to like try to fix it a little bit, and I break the clippers. I break the clippers in the moment in human history where you least want to break a pair of clippers. So, vacuum on medium. <laughs> no vacuum. They, so anyway, I did a poor job selecting them, and then I broke them, and I'll have another pair in another 15 days. Hopefully I won't look too atrocious by then. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, when this show was first being conceptualized, when we, we, before we even talked about recording, there was someone I wanted to have on as a guest. But I didn't know how to reach him. I have not spoken to this person in like 19 years. I think we fell out of touch because we both stopped using America Online. If if that's not a punchline, I don't know what is. 
but I want to bring him on. Um, I was good friends with him back in the 80s, 90s, and early part of the century, Mr. John Muse. John, thank you for coming on. Glad to be here. John, uh, I mean, not only are you a really knowledgeable wrestling fan, but you almost got into the business. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Well, it, it was a long, a long ride with, with ideas, basically. It was all around creative stuff and um, many years of plugging away, doing stuff. So I, I don't even want to cover this one, but I even sent things. I tried to fax something to Vince when I was like 22. <laughs> so, Hey, but you know what? I mean, I, I know this business well enough that you have to kick down that door, and if the door doesn't open, you have to keep kicking and kicking, and even if it takes years, if not decades, that's the only way you're getting in this business. It took about 12 years, and believe it or not, I actually got a uh, release from WWF from that attempt. They sent me, I gambled, they were all in Europe, and I figured, all right, people are in Europe. Vince didn't make those trips, so I figured, why not? I'll fax something to the office when I know most of them are probably gone. Nice strategy. Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking back then. Not as much now. Um, <laughs> but I, I tried it. I faxed in a, a three-month plan for WrestleMania at the time. Now, and what year was this? It would have been 90. I'd have to look back at it. I think it was like 90. Okay. Could have been 89, too. I'd have to look back. But I, it was in that range. Okay. And I still have all that material in, in a folder. I, I, I'm a hoarder. And oh, it. boy. A Facebook page coming up. Yes. Um, Gotta share that, man. Yeah, yeah. so it's, a, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a reasonable hoarder. I'll say it that way. I keep ideas. I'll write things down. I keep them. But I, I actually sent it in, and, and within a week or so, this registered thing from WWF showed up, and I, I actually had to contact Dave Meltzer over that. I'm like, have you ever seen this before? And, and what did you say? Response, his response was no. <laughs> So because there had to be plenty of people who were doing things exactly or similar to what you were doing. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I assume some people were. I, I sent them, if I recall, it was probably Undertaker relative time. I sent some things related to The Undertaker that they ended up doing in slightly altered fashion years later. Heel Undertaker in 98? Um, no, like, like original Undertaker stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, this would have been back after he debuted, right after he debuted. So it was it was like trying to bury Hulk Hogan, because I probably wanted to <laughs> at that point in time. Uh, we were not big Hulk Hogan fans right around this time. No, he had kind of uh, rubbed us raw by that point. But yeah, I mean, it started then. So, you know, WWF stuff, I, I faxed over. And then, you know, that really didn't come out of it. I don't know why they sent me release to begin with, unless maybe I thought. I wrote it off as maybe I stumbled onto something they were considering doing, or they just liked it and wanted to use it. And we're hoping I would just sign a paper and they could do what they want. Cause it was more or less by signing this paper, we can do what we want. And you're acknowledging that, you know, you didn't think of it more or less. <laughs> Basically we can to... use it for free. We can use your yeah, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which what they didn't understand at the time was if they had called me and asked me for that, I'd probably say, yeah. And, and I did actually reach out to them at one point after I got the release, just to kind of understand it, because I had some questions, and I, and I got a hold of somebody in the office, and I said, well, I'm trying to understand, you know, did, did, did Vince McMahon see this, and blah, 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 and they go, yes, and then they stopped. And then they like... changed topics. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, all right, maybe it did get to him. I don't know. But, you know, that was my first attempt to get something to somebody. And then I ended up working more or less through, you know, in Chris Avisa, you know, Chris Avisa. Of course. Um, His yeah, name's coming yeah. up. Yeah, he um, <laughs> he he knew a wrestler in the area, Mike Kelly, and then through Mike Kelly met Al Snow, then started helping out with Al Snow in Ohio with some booking stuff that led to you know being a creative like assistant, I guess, in Michigan around '95, uh -huh. and then running my own shows with some with Mike Kelly again. We ran shows in Michigan for a couple of years. We actually used Edge before he was Edge. Oh wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Sexton Hardcastle was his name before. Oh, I remember came. that. And yeah. he's not too far away. He's right from Toronto, so. Right. Yeah, and, and that's what it was. Was uh, he had he had been working in the area for another promoter. Saw him. Felt you know, wow, this guy's good. So we had him and and an El Fuego, who was Christian. They came and worked one of our shows, and we had Reckless Youth from the East Coast, Don Montoya from the East Coast, come in and do some shows. D'Lo Brown. Oh, nice. Yeah, you know, and even Al Snow came in and, and did some things. So 
you know, that's where the local stuff worked. But eventually I got tired of that because there's no TV. You know, it's not like today where I could have, you know, today I could have been producing internet content left and right. Yeah. I would have showed up at one of the, one of the shows with a camera and just have my stuff done. But there were things where I would, I'd write out months in advance, usually always three, at least in advance, knowing where I was going to go. And I, I would cross things off because I'm like, well, this really won't work without TV. Okay. So, you know, so anyway, all that aside, what eventually happened was through Dave Meltzer, Eric Bischoff called. And this is about when now? This, this would have been 2001 in February. Okay. So February, 2001. And, and I've been, I won't say slowing down. I mean, I was obviously paying attention to everything going on in, in wrestling, but I was not too creatively involved locally anymore you know, and ideas. And I would throw Dave ideas over the years all the time. My original way I ended up uh, coming in contact with Dave was through an idea that I had sent on something. And he had Chris Aviza contact me to say, is this real? Cause he didn't know. So the ideas always kind of got attention from, from Dave and, and I can't thank him enough for all that, you know, but he got a hold of Bischoff and Bischoff was talking to him a lot in that window of time. Yes. You know, cause as, as you know, fusion was going right. Mm-hmm. So, I think he was using Dave as a good sounding board of what Dave thought would work, what wouldn't work, et cetera. So then Eric Bischoff just called because Dave said, you should probably talk to this guy. Okay. And so what happened after that? Well, what, when he called, he wanted a specific plan. He wanted three months of cruiserweight material to build around Chavo Guerrero. Okay. Chavo Jr. Yeah. Chavo Jr. So let me see. I, I got, that material still, it ended up being about, I wrote three months worth of material for him. Plus another tack on idea that would have extended it another two months. I always give extra. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Well, I hate booking into a corner. So whenever I come up with ideas, I'm always thinking about where it would go next. And that kind of built into it. And what I did was they had started talking about doing cruiserweight tag titles. So in the mix, mix of all that, or mix, I said, okay, well, besides a three-month plan, I'll work on something that would extend it two months by putting in the middle of it, which was basically cruiserweight tag strife and you know feuds and things like this involved. And it turned out to be, throwing the cover page out, 14 pages that I wrote for him. Three-month plan, uh, a Nitro and a Thunder every week, and three pay-per-views. And what was the central idea that you used for Guerrero? The central idea was Ric Flair wanted Guerrero to become part of Team Elite. So he was recruiting him to join them, and Chavo was on the fence. He was a heel, but he was on the fence. So what Flair did was offer Guerrero a taste of the power, more or less. So what he said to Guerrero was, you can be the cruiserweight director. You're going to be the matchmaker. And Chavo would say something like, so I get to be the cruise director. And that was the, the gist of it. He became the guy that would make all the matches. And he was also the champ at the time. So the idea was he would be manipulating the division to his ends. And this would be his, you know, here, this is what you get by being part of the team. And I had Flair kind of give him an assistant, which was Mike Sanders. And then the two of them would kind of go off. It would start off where obviously they were just screwing around with everybody. Essentially, they were trying to break up every junior or cruiserweight tag team that was there, cause them all to have infighting and all of that. So then Chavo could keep the title, keep going, and eventually they would get the cruiserweight titles, the tag titles as well. But that was the overall goal. He would be the guy. He'd mess with everybody. And eventually Sanders would be doing things on his own causing friction between Chavo and Sanders for the eventual split, which would then make Chavo the baby face flare mad at Chavo. Now, here's what I like about this. In WCW and the WWF too, if you got put in as a cruiserweight, I think that tended to hurt the wrestlers. It hurt them getting over because it's like, okay, this is the little guy division. But by having flair in the mix, you're now legitimizing Guerrero and the entire division. Yes, that was definitely part of the goal because the idea would be Flair could eventually feud with him, yes. Okay, yeah, I, I like the idea. So how did Eric Bischoff get in touch with you? Did like Dave give him your number and then he reached out to you? Because this is 
when Eric and Dave were on good terms to the point where Eric was on Dave's IATA show, I don't want to say frequently, but he was on. Yeah, so Dave gave me the heads up that he would be reaching out to me. But yeah, Eric Bischoff called, got my number from Dave. <laughs> okay, and what was that conversation like? Like, did you know the call was, you knew the call was coming, right? Yeah, I knew the call was coming. Um, I don't recall if I knew what he was going to ask me for, but I knew the call was coming. Okay. I've had other calls that were surprises out of left field, but yeah, this one I knew. All right. Tell me about a couple of those. A couple of the surprises? Yeah. Jim Ross. Okay. Yeah, Jim Ross called. This was after the WCW thing fell through because WWE wanted some materials at that point. Well, they definitely could have used some at that point. <laughs> they hit the yeah, well, wall as soon as they got WCW. Yeah, I, I I gave them something. I probably shot myself in the foot with it, too. But, yeah, I, I gave them something that was better than what they did with it. Um, but, yeah, Jim Jim called. Uh, who else? Mick Foley. Oh, nice. Yeah, just a few a few things like that that were surprises. You don't know they're coming. And, and, and when JR reached out, it was also through Dave. Um, I think he kind of got the office involved there. And then I know Al Snow was also pulling for me. He was still in WWE at the time. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think like knowing what WCW is like, where everyone is just, you know, scratching to keep their spot, like that would have been a difficult environment for anyone outside of the business to come in and, you know, even be listened to a little bit. But if it's Eric Bischoff, who is now running the company, or theoretically, he was trying to buy WCW. And he would have run it, and he would have gotten to run it his way, the way Vince McMahon gets to run WWF his way. I think that's the only way wrestling succeeds. Yeah, you need to have that one voice. Yeah, and WCW did not have it. And by the way, obviously, I had one brief hello with Eric Bischoff. Obviously, you have a relationship with Eric. I mean, Eric Bischoff is a guy I have a lot of respect for. No one can tell me he's dumb, number one. He's a very intelligent guy, very accomplished. I mean, I remember the day he showed up in WCW. I saw him at the hotel in Baltimore for WCW, uh, the Great American Bash 91. And we're like, oh, wow, they're, they're bringing him in. And he slowly but surely ascended to power and earned his keep. I mean, I know a lot of people don't like him and... Everyone's going to quickly say, oh, well, you know, he didn't have WCW being successful for forever. No, he didn't. But he accomplished something I thought was damn near impossible. He got it off the ground and got it running to the point where it was the number one promotion in the world. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, would, I would agree with that. you know, Monday Nitro was his idea. He got the wrestling war started. And WCW, I mean, it's impossible the way it was set up for it not to have a lot of problems. Like I had heard from someone who would know that sometimes like the production people would overrule Eric Bischoff on certain things. Like that's no way oh, to really? run a company. Yeah. I didn't hear that one, but yeah, that'd be crazy. He's supposed to be the guy. Yeah. And he, he wasn't, and it was a, a big company that did other things besides wrestling. And I think if Eric Bischoff had purchased WCW, which, he seemed to be on his way to until a gentleman named Jamie Kellner canceled Nitro and Thunder. And at that point, WCW has no value. Right. Yeah. No TV. No. no yeah. Value. I mean, Vince McMahon, as we know, bought it, tried very hard to get it on television. And this is Vince McMahon. He can't do it. Other networks are saying no to him. And so obviously the wrestling craze had fizzled out a little bit at that point. John, let me ask you uh, to go back a few years earlier with the, the cruiserweights and WCW were a source of vast aggravation to me because show at night in and night out, every pay-per-view, they were the best matches in the card by far. I mean, the best guy, and they had guys there that could be main event guys. There were guys in that cruiserweight division that Vince McMahon turned into main event guys later on. Yeah. If you so when they started to bring in the, the the ECW guys and they brought in the Cruiserweight belt, if you were there from the beginning, how would you legitimize that belt? Well, one of the keys was they had to be separate from everybody else. You you legitimize it through the fact that their matches are going to be more exciting, and they're going to provide something you don't see necessarily from the heavyweights. But you have to keep the heavyweights away from them as much as possible, and then you do it through the competition that's behind the belts. 
you know, obviously you have to go a long way, you know, characters come involved in making, you know, trying to get characters over and things like this. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is the athleticism that that division would offer becomes what makes it legitimate in the excitement factor. But you have to keep the heavyweights away. And that was Bischoff flew me out to Arizona to have this discussion after he got the ideas. And that was one of the things I was looking for when he was talking. And, and he was pretty emphatic that they would be their own thing. That they'd be yours. It, it's your thing. It's separate. And that's what you're going to do. It will always seem to be treated like a second tier belt. When right. again, it, it, they had the best guys there. They just couldn't bring themselves to say the smaller guys were better. It was like the same problem Vince had a few years earlier. Right. And, and that's why, that's why I had that flare rub in there with Chavo was because, yeah. and John had brought that up was flair makes it more legit by him seeing Chavo as somebody of importance. Exactly. I remember, so, I'm sorry, yeah. go, John, go ahead. No, go no, ahead. I was just say, so if he's your guy and he's your champ and you have flair who's respected is saying, I want you on my team. This is important to me. And I'm going to let you run this division. That makes that division important. John, I remember right before you went on that trip, you and I were on the phone, number one. And I'm like, Buy a suit, man. Here's what kind of suit you got to have. Eric's big on clothes. And you're like, you're like, John, I already have a suit. I'm like, no, get this suit. And I just like, I was relentless about it. But anyway, I also remember making a suggestion that you liked because you weren't completely sure what you were flying out there for, but the possibility of it being, you know, you being the cruiserweight guy had been thrown out there. And I suggested, look, number one, you, you have to make them their own entity. And you had already said that. And I was like, do not have, when your cruiserweights are wrestling, don't cut away to see the NWO limo pulling up. And number right. two, put it like on a separate thing, like, okay, Sugar Ray Leonard, a middle of the pack heavyweight, would have beat the crap out of Leonard. But that didn't stop Leonard and Hagler and Hearns from being the best and most exciting fighters in the world. And you were like, yeah, I like that one too. <laughs> Yeah. That was funny, though, that, I, you know what, and thank you. I'm, I'm flattered that you would reach out to me when you're doing something that important or about to do something that important. Yeah, well, you know, I've always been the type of person that no idea is finished until, like, you have no choice. And until that idea is finished, and everything you're going to attempt to do to always bounce it off of people, number one, you can trust, people who have maybe a different opinion than you at times. because how many times have we seen in wrestling where something gets screwed over because the person that's doing it just has only one viewpoint and is tunneled in what they're doing. So I would bounce things off of people. You were one of those people. It was, it was, you know, number one, I count on honesty. I don't want to talk to people who are just going to go, Oh yeah, everything's great. <laughs> that's no that's good. Not, yeah, it doesn't help me because then it doesn't help me at all. Because if you, if you tell me, Hey, you know what, what about this? What about that? What about this? It may have been something I'm, I'm already planning, but if it isn't, I'm going to take that thought into account and, yeah. it, and it, it may make things better. And oftentimes it does, honestly. So, yeah, I, you know, I didn't know it was funny. I didn't know, like you said, I didn't know what was going to happen out in Arizona. And I did go with the suit that I had. I, I didn't want to put, didn't want to put the money in. I mean, we were talking, you know, I didn't have exactly a high paying job at the time. Um, and I, I went there and I realized within a few minutes of the conversation that the decision had already been made. This was just one of those, as long as I didn't show up looking like a total reject. Huh. That it was there because what he started off with, here's what I'm, I'm going to want you to do was kind of how it started. Oh, nice. So I'm like, okay, well I got it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and then he just started laying out what the plan was for what they were doing. I, I, you know, I mean, obviously it was 19 day, years ago. I mean, to this day, I'm disappointed. I always, I didn't like WCW in the nineties. I, I didn't, it was but hard at the same was, was, yeah, exactly. But I always, I never wanted it to go out of business because if it was around, it could always get better. If it was yeah. dead, it couldn't. Competition is better than no competition. Well, we saw that. Right? Yeah, saw you that see it now. Yeah. This is always interesting, John. What is, what is, if you're booking something, what is like your creative process? Because I know nothing about this, like how you would actually sit down and go, I'm doing three months, I'm doing four months. Like, what, what is your process for doing something like that? I don't have always a set duration. I used to work on three months just because that's how the pay-per-view cycles work. Yep. But that kind of went away with monthly pay-per-views. So then I stopped worrying about that. I work backwards. 
That, I mean, that's the, I know it sounds crazy, but that's the easiest way because you always know where you're starting from, but you got to know where you're going to. Oh, you definitely have to start, go backwards. So I start at the end of where I want to be, and then I start working backwards. Now, John, unlike a lot of, you know, fantasy booking people, like I always liked your stuff. I remember in 92, I was on the phone with you for a long time and you talked about something you were going to propose to the WWF. And one of the things I liked about it, like your booking was never shocks for the sake of shocks, which WWF was really doing in the late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, you laid out like a three, four, five month plan that involved exactly one turn, and that was the Mountie, and you were doing it because the Canadian Mounted Police were putting heat on the WWF over this character. So you're like, okay, we'll turn him. (laughs) I don't remember this. I I remember it kind of vaguely, but yeah, I'm not a person in favor of hot-shotting things. It doesn't work. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, um, it doesn't work. The reset button on its own doesn't work. I like the reset button. I really do. But it's got to have a plan behind it. In other words, like what we saw from the Russo era was like sort of reset button, reset button, reset button. Yeah. And there was no plan behind it. I like the reset button if things are obviously going wrong, like WWE right now is in serious need of a reset button. But there has to be a plan behind it. And right now, the reset button, if you think about it, is every year with the draft. That's a reset button. Uh, good point. It, it numbs people to the reset when you do that. I agree with you that, you know, You're doing it for the sake of doing it, and from a logical standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, you just jumble talent up, and then there's – it doesn't ever seem like there's a plan behind it. So it's like a reset button for the sake of it, and I think they need to stop that. But I'm not in favor of, like, hot-shotting massive amounts of turns. There needs to be something behind it because if there's nothing behind it, then, you know, your fans pay attention. And if they don't pay attention necessarily, like, to the degree that we do as fans, they do kind of pay attention to a trend over time. Like we might see something and pick up on it right away and go, wait, not good. Second time, same thing. But your casual fans, what they're going to be doing is like the third, fourth time you do this. They're going to start going, this is just, where are we going? They may not react the same way, but they, they pick up on it. And that's where Russo kind of hurt himself. Well, reset, not chatting. All that stuff just confuses people because the storylines have no payoff. And why do I care about them? Exactly. You know, I remember, one of, if not the first time I ever talked to Dave Meltzer, he told me that most wrestling fans remain wrestling fans for three years. And I was like, well, how does that happen? Because, because three years, you figured it all out. You figured out the pattern, you've seen it all, and you, you become less interested. Okay. I can believe that to some degree. Yeah, you start figuring things out. You raise a point, though. You know, I can actually pinpoint the date that I kind of figured out wrestling with the whole kayfabe thing. Okay, I want to hear this. It was actually you, you guys, you and Sean, last podcast brought up this that that reminded me of when I figured it all out was you talked about the Bulldogs were supposed to have a feud with the Funks. Uh Uh-huh. And what had happened was they actually did have a series with the Funks, but it was like Dory and I think it was Jimmy Jack, right? Jesse Barr was Jimmy Jack Funk. Yes. And what happened, because that was a big, huge Bulldog mark. You know, it's weird that you would, you know, you, you start out as a fan. My favorite people as a fan when I started watching wrestling was Randy Savage, British Bulldogs, Ricky Steamboat, Bret Hart. No idea why. This is like 86? That would have been 85 to 86 in that window. I was a huge Bulldog mark. But what happened in 86, in August of 86, I think it was around the 22nd, 23rd, somewhere in that range, the Bulldogs were at Joe Louis Arena facing Dory and Jimmy Jack. I was there for the match, saw it. And back then, my memory was exact. I I can remember the whole sequence of everything at the time, right? Well, the next day, they had a Madison Square Garden match. Well, I had a friend who had the satellite. So I go over to my friend's house because I'm going to watch two days in a row WWF. And on the card, British Bulldogs versus Dory and Jimmy Jack. And they ran the same match. Well, I mean, and you remained a fan. But, I mean, yeah, Yeah. that was kind of your – I'm trying to think of what my first real peek behind the curtain was. Security? Curiosity back in the territory days only caused tears. <laughs> Mind your own business. I like Florida. I like Georgia. That's it. Don't go asking questions. That's right. <laughs> I'm trying to pinpoint like my moment where I just, like kind of figured it out. And I don't know if there was one. I do know when I first started watching, like people couldn't wait to tell me it was fake. Yeah. But, like, the way it worked. I, I don't think 
I mean, obviously, when I got started getting the Observer at the end of 86, I mean, my God, the, you know, talking about the, <laughs> I mean, the ultimate, oh, my God, I've got all this information now. But you, you didn't know what to do with yourself, right? Yeah, no idea. I mean, talk about a, a life changing event. I got home at like three, four in the morning on um, Friday and look what's arrived in the mail. And I was up reading them until the sun came up. Oh, yeah. Mine may have been the uh, Bulldog still, I'm still, I'm sitting, uh I think it may have been a uh, Davy Boy Smith move, his vertical suplex. He used to do this vertical suplex where he'd hold the guy up for like four seconds or something. And I'm, yeah. I'm looking at this, like even a 10, I'm like, okay, that's impossible. <laughs> All the yeah. guy has to the do is move, move like an inch. Or, if, you know, it may have been one of the things where Snooker was doing a splash and the guy was out for a month. But, I mean, oh, yeah. I remember that specifically thinking, watching – Davy boy hold somebody up going, why does he just like lean back a little? Right. <laughs> Throw off the ba- balance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. I mean, that one. R- wrestling on a lot of levels, you know, has never made sense. I mean, this guy is lying on the ground. He's obviously defenseless. And instead of just pinning him, Jimmy's like, oh, I'll jump off the top rope on this guy. <laughs> yeah. Those are things that, you know, I mean, obviously even before it really becomes odd, you know, apparent that it's, it's worked. You, you have those moments where you go, okay, they have to be cooperating a little bit and they're trying to put something on and, and whatnot. But, you know, we all have that moment where it's like, all right, at this point, it really has to be the level of cooperation is what comes into yeah. view. The figure yeah, four may have been of... another thing. Go ahead. No, I agree. I agree, Sean. I mean, the guy's just laying there letting you put this oh. hold on him. I mean, there's example after example, but I mean, the snooker one might be the best one. But yeah, John pretty much hit it. It's the level of cooperation. When you see certain moves, but see, fans don't want to pay attention to this. I, I conveniently ignored this for 20 years. Oh, yeah. All you need to do is suspend your belief for what's the match. And then and right. just don't think about it too much. And then yeah. go about your merry business. And the great ones could do that. I, I remember what was I, I, John put me onto the match and it was, um, and I've praised it to um, blue in the face. It was the match where uh, it was the Dundee and Blandell deal where they went after uh, Jeff Jarrett and uh, Jerry Jarrett, and they finally had a call up. Uh, Dutch ran out right out of the shower. And I got into this. Like, I knew it was going to happen, but it didn't matter. They were good enough where they hooked me. Yeah, and that, that's the key. That's what makes those particular people and, and ideas and things like that, that's what makes that work, is that even if you know it is you know, of work or you know it's, there's cooperation involved, you can go, you know what, this is just good, and you just forget what about it. Cause I didn't change, even though I knew what I saw. You know, I okay, two days in a row, I see the same match move for move. But you know, next time wrestling's on TV, mm-hmm. there I am watching. I mean, I it happened um, in doing some research for one of our shows. I was watching Clash One, and I got into the uh, what was the um, the Fantastics Midnight match again, and the Rotunda match. Yeah, I saw this one. I've seen this ten times, but it doesn't matter. These guys are that good. Thinking of that, what do you look for, John, in someone you want to push? Like if you got the kind of the raw talent and say he's not overly an established guy, but you're like, okay, you. It's never the same. It, it, there's always a little something different. I, I, I like different guys for different things. It's like, I like somebody who either a, they're really good in the ring. I mean, obviously I want that anyway, but um, somebody really good in the ring that maybe doesn't have, you know, then you got to look at a different perspective of they're a great worker, but you got to work on something to make them stand out or different then, but there's people I also like that, don't necessarily work as good, but have humor, have something about their charisma, something that makes them stand out where you go, okay, yeah, I might have to do some more things or or work some things into the matches or whatever to where I hide things, but they can talk or, you know, they have something about them that makes them above average. doesn't have to be everything. Obviously that's Mm -hmm. a perfect situation for Ric Flair, but you're not going to have, I mean, how many of those are going to come along? The humor thing can be dangerous, I, I, but it can work. I remember one guy can delegitimize you to an extent if you get to be looked at that way. One time it worked in ECW was um, Mick Foley. And mm-hmm. when he would do the jokes about, you know, come back to Uncle Eric, guys, you know, this isn't the right way, oh, yeah. this hardcore wrestling. I was wrong the whole time. Yeah, he can make that joke because everyone knows that he's taken that nasty, nasty plunge, you know, splash on a million concrete floors or, you know, all the stuff yeah. he's done, he can, you know, he has enough credibility where he can make that joke. Do you look at that in humor, how it could possibly negatively oh, affect yeah. the guy? Oh yeah. I, I love McFoley. We, um, I took 
Well, one trip for the Tom Robinson benefit, you know, 10 hour drive or whatever was for that reason for the Tom Robinson and to see the show. But I mean, I made one Philly trip just to see the Gilbert and Nick, you know, the three matches they had. And this would have been, I think it was uh 91, 91 for that one. Goodhart. Yeah. The, the Goodhart card, right? Mick Foley's great. And what took Mick over the top was the interview ability too. I mean, he already had the ability to have really good matches and go out there and tear a house down. But I don't know how you felt about this, John, at the time too, but didn't you always feel there was kind of like maybe a limit because who would, you know, he didn't fit the stereotypical role of this star, right? No. His, his look wasn't there for that. But then when he added the, when he like could talk, it changed everything. Because now it's like, okay, there's a personality there. It's not just a guy taking bumps. But he also goes to what you were saying was that everything meant something with him. When he oh, was yeah. funny, he was funny for a reason. There yeah. was everything involved. The one thing that was never tarnished was he always had this core of a character that never moved. He could be funny. He could be scary. But that, you know, he was always that guy. And he was he was great at that. Very few yeah. guys were able to pull that off where they could kind of, you know, Terry Funk did it, too. But oh, yeah. where you kind of go all over the place, but you're still that guy. So you could be funny, but it doesn't matter. You're funny being Terry Funk. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's. So I, I do look for humor because you need you need that. I'm a believer in the idea of whatever product you're presenting. It can't be always ultra serious. It can't be always comedy. You, you've got to have a balance of all yeah. of those things. I completely if, if you, agree. Yeah, if you don't, it won't work. You know, something you were talking about, like how you put together something booking wise. There's for me, there's two elements of it. OK, this is, you know, granted, I haven't booked in 28 years. But there's two elements, okay? Element A, you see a guy and you see a talent in him. You say, okay, what am I going to do with this guy? Because he's good. I got to figure something out. Then the other element is, okay, here's this idea I have, and I don't know which characters I want to incorporate into this idea. This guy over here is good for this concept, whereas he might not be the guy, you know, the ultimate guy I want to push. Okay, I got to figure out something to do with this guy. The guy might be someone that you can put into that concept. Okay, here's an angle I want to run. I think this angle would be good. I think he would be good in this role. Yeah. I also wanted to talk about, you had mentioned you would like, you know, okay, you would seek out feedback from people. And you wanted honest feedback. If someone didn't like something, they would tell you. I remember, God, this is almost 30 years ago. It, w- it was 30 years ago. You, me, and Chris Avisa were out getting something to eat. And Chris came up with a storyline he thought would work for the WWF that included, like, using Japanese wrestlers and having this storyline interweaved where, you know, the Japanese corporations are taking over everything, and that's what the angle is. I'm like, Chris, WWF fans don't want to see that. It's too complicated. And Chris was like, giving me this look, like, oh, man, you don't like my idea. How is Chris? Are you still in touch with him? It's been a few years. I know he's really not, he might still pay attention to some Japanese wrestling, but last time I talked to him, he'd, he'd kind of not watched anything from what he said. I, I do need to check in with him, but I, I think I'll probably be doing that soon. But yeah, he he wasn't following it last time I talked to him, and it's been a few years. All right. When you do speak with him, please definitely let him know that I said hello. He was a really good guy. Oh, yeah. He's fun. He he worked as a manager on some of the shows here. That's right. Yeah. I've, I've was, seen those tapes. Oh, yeah. He was he was fun, and I he would come up with ideas. And, and that's the other thing, too, is that you've got to be open to ideas even if they're not yours. And, and he would come up, we'd, I'd have an idea of what I wanted on the show or whatever for who he managed and, and what he was going to do. And then he would come up and go, I can get this gimmicked bottle. I'm like, all right, we'll break it on somebody's head. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, you want that creativity because number one, that makes people engaged. I don't know if you're keeping up with AEW closely, but look what Moxley, right? Moxley was miserable in WWE because he didn't feel like he was engaged. And if you have people who feel engaged and know that they can, you know, give creative input, they're going to care more. They're going to be better. Yes. And they're going to actually speak from a point of realness to it. You know, I used to hear that the WWE did not let, I don't know if this is still the case. It was the case at one point. The writers could not interact with the talent 
which makes absolutely no sense. Now, John, I'm sure you've been down this road. Everyone in the business, all the talent in the business has an idea of how they would like to be used. They have this angle they want to be in with this person. They want their friends pushed. And I would always tell people, look, I'm always willing to listen to an idea. You know, you can be comfortable throwing out an idea that you think is dumb because maybe I would like it or maybe, okay, I dislike 80% of this idea, but I like that 20% and we can cut out the 80. And maybe work. it's better. Yeah. But the other element to it is that I, and I would tell people this, look, I'm happy to hear out your ideas, but you have to be okay with me maybe not using them if that's just not the general direction I want it to go in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you have, have to, to have get them psychologically yeah. involved. How would you, like, John, I mean, if they're not going to buy into what you're doing, which is why you're right, John, that's madness, how you don't have the people uh, talking to each other. Because if the talent's not buying into what they're doing, would you have been allowed in WCW with contact with the talent? I would hope. It sounded to me like, yeah. I, you know, he, he pretty much told me that it would be my division and I'd just run it. I would never run something like that without talking to the talent. I mean, you have to talk to them to tell them what you want anyway, but I would want, I guess here's the best way. It's like John just explained when we were talking about ideas at a restaurant. I will book on the fly. So while I'm having a conversation with somebody about an idea, presenting an idea, talking about something I wanted to do, I'm actually still thinking through it. So while I'm talking about it, I may add something to it while I'm talking about it. Something they say may bring something into it that I hadn't thought of that I would love. It's that exchange because it's basically people thinking about what you want to do. And anytime you're thinking and people are creative like that, you may get more organically out of that conversation than you necessarily would have if you were sitting alone writing it down on a paper. Different perspective. About 10 years ago, there was a guy who was in the WWF writing room, okay? And he came up with this idea that a Nazi who was encased in ice somehow and he was going to be, what's what I'm looking for? He's going to come back to life, and this was going to be the wrestling character. And the guy started goose-stepping around the room about, you know, what this character was going to be like. And everyone else hated it but me. Now, you see, I don't like the character. But if you're going to be in that writing room, you have to not be afraid of expressing the stupidest idea in your head. You have to have people not afraid to do that. otherwise. They are going to suppress the good ideas. Throw out all the ideas. We'll talk about them, and we'll narrow it down to the best ones. The AWA pushed a Nazi as their tag team champion in a baby face in Minnesota. That's pretty much out the window right now. You can see why Jerry got confused. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I didn't say go with that gimmick. Definitely no, don't go with that gimmick. But, but don't yeah. be afraid to express, hey, look, I've got this idea. Yeah. What I think you're pointing to, and I would agree, is that you don't want to stifle creativity. Exactly. Because if you do that, you're going to lose things. It doesn't mean that you know, you're not going to come up with something good elsewhere or whatever like this, but if, if there's an element that's stifling creativity, some things just won't get said. Something that, you know, if a person gets shot down from presenting an idea, even if you agree in the end it's not good, but if they get shot down in such a way where they go, all right, I got to be careful what I present then what you're going to have is a situation where they may have like the best idea ever and they don't say it. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't know it's the best idea ever. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they just think, okay, I think they're going to hate this. So I just won't present it. And, and maybe, maybe at the end, of, like you said, the idea itself may have been bad, but something in whatever was said, maybe there's like one little piece of it that was usable. It's not about the ideas. It's about the environment. Right. If Jerry Lawler had said to a bunch of people, you know, had been in on this, you know, hey, I think I should call this the Raymond Noodle Suplex, everyone would been like, uh, no, Jerry, that's not a good idea, and we'd be all set right now. No. He's done, huh? I can't help but think he's done. Yeah. Or at least he's on ice, pardon the pun. Right. John, going through some of the – who were the guys in the, uh, the late 90s, early, you know, 2000? In WCW Cruiserweight, you would look at, like, if you had control for the next couple of years, maybe they weren't ready yet, but you could definitely see something there. Well, they had a good crew. And, I mean, I they had, what, Kidman? They had mm -hmm. Ray at the time. Helms, Moore, the Dragons, right? They had those guys there. 
Um, I know Michael Modest and Daniels had started up, and they were on, you know, I had a list of guys, and they were adding some of these guys before I got involved. You know, and there's people like Kid Cash, super crazy. You had names that were out there that you could have grabbed up and used, and they had people in the. I was going to ask, did you have a wish list maybe of guys who weren't there that you wouldn't have minded bringing in someone from Mexico or Japan? So I didn't take good notes on that one, but I had, you know, I had super crazy written down, Kid Cash written down on a piece of paper in the notes in there. So they might have been on my wish list. I was planning on going in with, because the other thing too is Eric made a comment. He didn't give me names, but he did say that some people that would likely be part of that division he was already talking to some people which kind of made me a little bit concerned because i'm thinking okay what what are you going to give me but i did like the the core that they had and i knew that if it's a separate division it's, it's winnable it's something you can pull off and, and he what also th- said i i could have input into the other areas too and i had ideas on the other area stuff what do you think about bringing in some managers for them? Because I know that was part of the problem. I mean, Kidman was great in the ring. He just was – promos were mm. – Yeah, um, I hadn't gotten to a manager thought. I didn't use a manager in any of the stuff that I did send to Bischoff. The goal along the way was I was trying to get Sanders over a little bit because I thought he played a good asshole role. Mm-hmm. So I had him kind of being an asshole. But it, honestly, I don't know – he could have ended up being a more of a manager type role eventually too, but I hadn't really gotten into the manager aspect of things. I was really focusing on exciting matches and trying to build that division without having to worry about being mucked with by, Oh, it's a great idea. If you know, Kevin Nash comes in and kills these two guys. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That was very helpful. Around this time, like managers, Managers had be, had gone away. They'd become cliche. The uh, valets or whatever you want to call them had taken over. I mean, just I, it's unfortunate, but that era was dead. Now, one thing you maybe could have done was hooked one of the cruiserweights up with one of the, I mean, top divas or whatever whatever they're called, valets in WCW. Yeah, that would have been a potential thing too. Or how about uh, here's one because the show was awful by this point anyway. I would just give you guys the show, see what you could do. Uh, the Saturday night show. Like a 68, have it almost like a very heavily influenced Cruiserweight division. Because again, that show, I remember at that point, was just terrible. So it's almost like I'm, you figure you're working with house money. How much of a difference could that have made in the separation, per se? Um, if you could have gotten a, a time slot, even if it's a nothing time slot. Well, you'd have to have more guys. But yeah, I mean, you could do that. But the one thing I would be careful to avoid was I wouldn't want that show to be the only presence of the cruiserweights, right? So whatever the main show is, they would still have to have a role there. Otherwise, people would see it as, well, they're not even good enough to be on the big show. So I would definitely be like, oh, you're going to give me an hour TV? Great. Yeah. All right. And I would definitely appreciate something like that, but I would still want to make sure we had some presence on the other show. Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Here's what I'm talking about when I say that Eric Bischoff, you know, they needed that one guy in charge because there was an idea floating out there that the Saturday night show, and this is around 99, 2000, because now the 605 TBS show is now a throwaway show. There was consideration given. I think it was Jimmy Hart's idea. It had to be Jimmy Hart's idea to use that show as a means to book the guys who are just breaking in, the guys who they don't have room for on Nitro and use them and use that show as kind of almost a minor league show, like an NXT, to give these guys some seasoning and to see, you know, what they can do. And I remember, like, specific guys in WCW made sure that did not happen because, number one, they didn't want Jimmy Hart to get over as a good booker, and number two, they didn't want (laughs) the guys underneath to get over. That's a great philosophy right there. It kind of points out to why they kind of, you know, pretty much failed. I mean, (laughs) that show was... When they started calling that show the mothership by the late 90s, that was kind of like calling the Atlanta Braves America's team in the mid-80s when the, you know, Gene Gerber and uh, you know, whatever other junk was on that team. I mean, it's, it's just it, the show was a joke. Even doing anything differently at this point would have been an improvement, even if it was bad. Well, like, that means that was the environment of WCW was a complete cesspool. Everyone was out for themselves and, and themselves only, and maybe there's nothing wrong with that, but the guys were running around sabotaging each other. There's the problem. The first part's okay, but you have to figure out a way to channel the competition into having the improved product. So, okay, if you're the booker, John, how do you do that? 
how do you get it away from the backbiting and get the guys to actually compete for the better spots? That good strife, as the old Greeks called it. Yeah, it's it's difficult. I don't know if it would have been saveable. I mean, even though I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm going to come to work, and it was going forward on the idea of that's where things are going. I was going to be either moving to L.A. or Vegas. You know, I always worried, and this is where I wanted to make sure at least he was in agreement that it would be a separate thing because if nothing else, that at least gave me the, the feeling that I would have a chance to make it work if I knew that, you know, I wouldn't get the tap on the shoulder. Hey, you know, uh, this thing you're going to do with Kidman, maybe we should tone that down a little bit because, you know, you can give me eight number of reasons other than the one, which is we don't want him to get over too much. That's WCW for you. Yeah. And, and I was worried about that. I'm like, I don't know if I'll survive, but if I get a contract and I'm getting X amount of money guaranteed, okay, whatever. I'll try to fight the fight. <laughs> At the end of the day, everybody has to feel that they're all pulling in the same direction. And what happens usually is the top guys in WCW at the time were just pulling in their own direction. And then everybody that doesn't have any pull is pretty much left out in the cold. And that's kind of what happened. And that's why guys get cut off. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. even if Bischoff had complete control of the thing, I mean, you and, and this had happened. They, they'd hired you. You you know, the cruiserweight division was your baby. You would know every day coming to work that they were a group of guys out to sabotage you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One nice thing about working in the Michigan Indies at the time was that there were uh, three different promotions in the area, all fighting over the same 200 fans. Um, <laughs> Welcome to 90s Indies wrestling, everyone. Exactly. exactly. People who talk about the great Indies today. You, you saw it, John. You dealt with it, right? Well, yeah. Christ. Some guy has never promoted before announces to me that Manchester, New Hampshire is his town. <laughs> there you go. So we had a geographical distance between us, but it was still close enough to where, you know, what the other promotions are doing could impact you type situations. And I would have, you know, guys, Oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to job your champion on my show type stuff. I'm going, I don't care because we're fighting over the same 150, 200 fans. We're going to come to every show anyway, but there were so much attempts at backstabbing things like this. So I, I would just, I, what I relied on was very simple. If, they do whatever they do on their end. I'm going to focus on mine mm -hmm. and do everything I can do to get my people over. And then in turn, get the product over to where whatever happens someplace else doesn't matter to me. It doesn't hurt me. And that's exactly the way I look at it. Just, you know, don't worry about what's going on in Boston or whatever. Worry about, you know, what's going on in the ring in front of you. Cause you you'll go nuts trying to control all that. John, one right. last thing I'd like to ask you I'd, I don't know if we ever talked about this before, but if you were going to become like the, you know, the CEO of the cruise rates in WCW, like I would think one of your main responsibilities, and this sounds so obvious and it's not, let me take a step back. Like I had a conversation with Dusty Rhodes in 1988 when he was the booker of the NWA and he did not know who Owen Hart was, and he did not know who Brian Pillman was. Oh. And I know he's got a lot going on, man, but if you're the booker of the number two wrestling company in America, you've got to know who everyone is. That's part of your job. Instead of going out and partying on a Tuesday night, you know, bring a VCR to your hotel room and watch Calgary wrestling. Watch all the wrestling there is to watch, including and especially WWF, because mm -hmm. you need to be an expert on all of this. Like, and I think you would have had to be an expert on every cruiser rate wrestler in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I was trying to do that, you know, you always have to learn. So you'd, like you said, you'd want to have the tapes. You want to watch tapes. You'd also want to surround yourself with people who do that same thing. Like Mike Tenay would have been somebody. Yeah. It'd be a situation where, you know, maybe he's not officially tied to creative, but it'd be me and Mike Tenay talking about this guy, that guy, this guy, what do you think? Again, it goes back to what we talked about where I try to get opinions from people, and he would have been one of the people because I know he also pays attention to what's going on around things, or at least he did back then. I'm not sure what he's doing now. But yeah, you, you, you want to do that. You want to know, it, and honestly, it would go beyond the cruiserweights because between us, my intention was I got the cruiserweights, but I'm going to be putting ideas in over on the big show because I want to try to get that too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, you, you would be watching like tapes from Mexico, Japan, Indies, and looking mm -hmm. at prospective, you know, new employees, because let's face it, you can't go with that same crew of eight or 10 guys forever. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. You have to watch. I mean, I watch indie, Indies now. There's a couple of indie guys that I like. There's one out of the Michigan area that I think could 
roll into a promotion today and work. I What's his name? Dan Housen. Okay, uh, I have not heard of him, but I will take your word for it. John, I have been wanting to do this show for over two years. Thank you for coming on. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the invite. I haven't really had many conversations about wrestling lately, but I appreciate it. No, thank you. And Sean, thank you for being our convivial co-host. We appreciate everything you do. I want to thank our producer, Lou Kippelman, who makes this show sound halfway decent through his magic. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We'll see you next week.